I'll still thank you for, for that. It was very good. Thank you very much. As we're late, Diogo, you take the lead now. Diogo, yes, Diogo Lorenzo from <laughs> Sash, yes. Um, go on, and I'll wrap it up at the end. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Hi. Um, wrong slide. Guilherme? This is not mine. <laughs> I, I can talk about Deloitte. <laughs> I don't think if they want, though. Can I try? Where should I point this? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So we're starting from the middle of the presentation? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> no worries. So, hi, uh, my name is Diogo and I work for SaaS. <clears throat> and today I'm going to talk to you about how can we help companies become market-driven, the main concepts behind it, and uh, a real-life example. So, I'll start things off with one question. Uh, and this question is, how does an a, a company like Apple, that is such a huge innovative technology company copied the market approach of a tomato sauce in the late 70s. So anyone knows the answer for this? No one? Okay. That's nice. <clears throat> so this struck me because last week we had the new iPhone launch. And um, did anyone watch the launch? So. I remind myself about the previous launches from iPhone, and the previous launches from iPhone, we used to get huge queues, right? Waiting for to get their hands on the new iPhones. And in the end, a few dozens of people wouldn't get the, their hands on a new iPhone. The, the iPhone would be sold off, there was no availability. So the first concept of uh, being market-driven is availability. Companies need to ensure that they are, make their products available for, for their consum consumers, right? So, <clears throat> if we think about ourselves as consumers, we don't, take, we don't care of the lengths that the company goes through to deliver a product. We don't care if an iPhone is made from, uh, the LCD is made from LG, the components are from, made from Samsung, or the camera from, uh, from uh, Sony. We don't care about that. We just need for the iPhone to be ready in our store for us to buy it, right? We don't really care about it. So this is the first concept, availability. Companies, either if it's a CPG, either if it's an Apple a technology company, or if it's a retailer, we need to ensure that our products are on the store, on the shelves, to be ready to buy it. So this leads me to my next point. And my next point is on the change of market approach that we saw in this launch, right? So do you remember when we only had one iPhone to choose from? How simple was that? So now we have three different choices of overpriced phones to choose from, right? And their only main difference is in the cameras. So one has the cheapest one has one camera, and the other one has two, and the third one has three cameras. That's insane. <coughs> um, but what does this mean? What does this mean? This change in approach. So now we have to make sure that not only one product is available, but four products are available in our stores. And this reminded me of a story that I've heard about a tomato sauce company. So this company called Prego, they started. They wanted to enter in the in the tomato sauce industry. So the first thing they could do, they launch a product, amazing quality, and the thing is, on the first year, they get more than 100 million in sales in tomato sauce. And they, be, they are able to capture more than 30% of the market, market share. So these guys continually are growing for five years until there is a this competitor that comes in and, and starts getting some traction as well. So this is almost like the Samsung Apple story war right now, right? When one has this brilliant marketing and another has a good products. So this is basically what, what was happening here. And so these guys, they were losing sales 
and they go to this guru and, uh, in the food industry and they ask them, can you make the perfect recipe for tomato sauce for me? And the guy said, there is no such thing as a perfect tomato sauce. There is only, uh, but everyone has a tomato sauce that is right for them. So you just need to find it. So these guys, they, they came to the market, they tested all these different types of tomato sauces, and they came up with um, 40 different, 47 different types of sauces. This is insane. They captured a percentage of the market that no one else was taking care of. And these guys kept growing. But does this look similar to you in any way? Right? <coughs> so now we have different types of products for different types of lifestyle, for different types of tastes, and different types of products from iPhones to tomato sauce. So not only now we have to ensure that we have availability of one product, we have 47 different types of products that we need to ensure they have availability, availability on the stores. And when we mix these two together, what happens is that I spend much more time looking for a tomato sauce, right? <laughs> now I have different options, and some of them are not even available for me. What if I wanted one of those that is not available? What if I want that one specifically? And, but so the guy that is in front of me, and he just took it. So now, companies have to worry about the availability of products 24-7, but they have a different range of products available. What happens? This is the, the, the second one of the concept. Is companies are di diversifying their profile, their, 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 um, their product line, right? And then there, there is this, come, this change in customer, in customer behavior. We no longer want just a tomato sauce, no. I want uh, the tomato sauce that was made with mushrooms in the Himalayas, right? We want an experience. We want something different from what we used to. And this is a, a change in the customer behavior that companies were not ready for it. Companies usually deal with only one product. When their range of products start growing, they continue, they continue to doing the same things. And um, if we ask them, but are you ready for this change? They would say, yes, I have my supply chain, my supply chain is optimized, I'm doing lean management, I'm taking Six Sigma, uh, approaches, I'm doing um, continuous improvement initiatives throughout all my supply chain. My, my supply chain is completely, um, it's completely lean. Everything is connected, and they do everything fine, but then in the, in the end, we see that they're having more costs than they should. They're still working as if they have only one product in their product line. So what happens is that we need to change from this perspective of, uh, of a link that actually it's not linked. There are different silos. Everything does the same. So the guys in development, they don't care about the guys in sales, right? Why should be the marketeers that should define when we are going to have the promotion? Why? We have the demand planners, and the demand planners are looking through the sales forecast, are looking through, through consumption. They know when there is going to be a spike, they know when it's going to be a downhill. Why shouldn't it be the demand planners th that said, okay, marketeers, we have a problem in this week. We need to do something. And this should be the reality. The reality should be that we don't have a supply chain, but we have a supply network where everything is connected and everything, I don't know if you can see it, and everything should be planned. The plan should be the center of everything. And this is a huge change in paradigm for companies. So I'm going to tell you a story about a real life example of a company where we worked. And this company was uh, is a CPG company. Their main focus was maintaining availability, right? The number one concept. And they usually only have one product. And the competitors only have one product as well. So when this, this things started to change, they become, they, they're starting to have more products and even substitutes for their, for their main product. So right now, they have more than 200 products on their line, okay? So remember these numbers, 99 availability percentage, <clears throat> more than 200 SKUs. So I asked them, wow, how can you make 99% uh, availability with 200 SKUs, 200 products? on the shelves. And the guys told me, okay, 
So I have a demand planning team of three people that do the sales forecast for every day for the 200 SKUs. So they will send that to a production. And the production, sometimes they don't really care about the production plan that the, forca that the forecast was made of. So they would do their own optimization and they would produce the amount that they think that they should. And then they would send that to either their uh, main warehouses or to the other rented warehouses that they had. So I started putting some warning signs right over there. So r their own warehouses and rented warehouses. And then the distribution would uh, either or, uh, supply for orders that they already had, or they would uh, go through um, only fulfilling the remaining supply, the, the, the remaining stock level supplies. So as I was writing down everything, and then when I looked through the paper of the customer challenges, I written down 99% availability, 200 SKUs, poor forecast, w rented warehouses, and poor distribution plan. So I think about this, and I was like, so this is the ultimate cost of having 99% availability. So a company that is not ready to become market-driven, they need to have more product available to fight their demand. And this is the problem when you cannot, when you cannot predict your demand, when you don't do a good sales forecast. So what we did with these guys was we changed their paradigm. So they would only use historical sales to do their forecast, and we try to mix that with, distributions, with distribution data. So we mixed with distribution data, and we started doing a hierarchy approach. So let's see what, there's, what is cons 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 consumed in both north and south, in south in on-trade and off-trade. And by the way, on-trade is bars and restaurants, off-trade is uh, supply chains, sup uh, sorry, retailers like supermarkets. And then on uh, each of them, we will do by channel and then by product. So right now, we already know what is consum wh what's the consumption, what's the demand in north of Portugal on, that, on the bar and for that product. This is, uh, this is a completely changing paradigm because they didn't do any of this. They had no idea what would be their demand on the north of Portugal on that restaurant. So with this, <clears throat> this was our result. So we put this model into practice and we run it by 10 weeks to just to, to test it. And in 10 weeks, we were able to, uh, only in 10 weeks, we were able to have like 9.1% increase in model forecasting accuracy. So these guys, they are doing forecasts for two or three years. They're constantly on 60, 65%. And with ten, in, within 10 weeks, we were able to increase their forecast accuracy by 9%. This is huge, because this means, <coughs> this means that they will have a, redu a reduction in waste. But how did we achieve this? So for us to achieve this, I will start with on-trade, with bars and restaurants. So we took their historical data. This is typical. So we analyzed um, their data from a, a data point to check for seasonality, for trends, for events, for outliers. And we modeled everything. We run some um, algorithms. And then we test these algorithms in a more closer horizon. Okay? <coughs> so now we see which algorithm is better for my data points. And in this case, it was the model tree. So right now, what we're going to do is that we're going to apply that model to every single history and start forecasting on it. So this was really good for uh, on-trade because on-trade is really where you get the consumption instantaneously. So I'm going, if I am thirsty, I'm thirsty or if I'm hungry, I'm going to a bar and I'm going to get a product. So the consumption is instantaneous. For off-trade, I mean retailers or supermarkets, I only go there like once a week, once a month. So we cannot use seasonality and trends to model that. We are going to use promotions and price, uh, our price, promotions, and price of the competitors in order to model it. So that was what we did in, 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 this, in this use case. What are the benefits? So I, I showed you that we got 9.1% increase in accuracy 
But actually, what does this mean? What is the meaning of this number through the supply chain? So now that they know where exactly they're going to have the consumption, they're going, they, they can distribute right to that place. So um, imagine, what they used to have was like, I'm going to ship my product to this platform, and then my project, my, my product is going into its, its due date, right? Its validity is going to expire, so I'm going to ship it to a place where uh, it can get, get sold faster. So this was what they did all the time. And for this, they had five million of costs per year doing this type of transition. So now we can help them reduce that. Okay, That's one optimization. The next one is uh, on inventory levels. So they had really high inventory levels because, <clears throat> because um, they didn't predict demand. So if, if, you don't, if you're not able to predict demand and you want to have a high availability of products, you have to have a lot of stock near the distribution centers. So what we did was, OK, but now we can predict 9.0% better than you used to. So you can reduce 9% of your stock. And if I told you that these guys had 15, 15 million euros on storage costs every year, we are reducing 9.1%. This is uh, almost 1.3 million per year that we're saving, okay? And finally, there, are, there, is all, there is always product that is going to be, in the food industry, there is always product that is going to be through its, its expiracy date, right? And this kept happening. But with more demand planning, with more accurate demand planning, we are able to understand where that, where that uh, inventory should go. So we also had a 15 reduction in waste. So summing all of these, we can help them like get reduced costs, like two million per year costs in costs. Like summing summing this up, and these guys weren't able to do it because simply because they had this strict supply chain. It was not connecting. They were not connecting data from several data points just to do planning. They were completely unorganized. And how did SaaS do this? I don't know if you guys know, know about SaaS, but SaaS relies on something that we call analytics lifecycle, that we, sh we get the data, and we get the data from everywhere. We don't care where the data is. We're going to get your data, we're going to treat your data, analyze it, and then we will run models on it. Either if it's machine learning, it's computer vision, NPL, forecasting, optimization, whatever. We can do all of these models. But the most important thing is that, after all, we can deploy it. A lot of people talk about analytics, talk about AI, talk about machine learning, but they, they don't talk about the ugly part, the deployment. So now we have our data, we extract our data, we run our models, so what? I have to deploy this in real time, right? I have to get the data from distribution, from sales forecasts, analyze it, and then deploy it on the ERP for the, it continues the, the process. So this is what SaaS do. We, get, we, don't, we don't invade anything. We just optimize and, and build up on the capacities of the legacy systems that they're, they're existing in the companies. <clears throat> and we are doing this for more than 43 years across uh, CPG and manufacturing. This is um, across CPG and manufacturing with different use cases in the main companies. And uh, we go from forecast, forecast demand planning to uh, predictive maintenance to quality defects. We run the whole thing. So this was my presentation. I didn't present myself, but I'm the industry lead for manufacturing and CPG at SAS. And, um, before we, we run through, I just, we finish this up, I would like you guys to pick your iPhone or your phone. And if you go to the LinkedIn, there is one thing that is called uh, We Can Connect Us All. And I don't know if you guys, but this is a networking event. So basically, if you guys want to connect with everything, everyone in this room, just pick up your, your phones and go through your LinkedIn app. And uh, in your LinkedIn app, you will see something in my network. And in my network, you will see like a, a plus. And if you guys want to connect to everyone in this room, and I want to connect to you guys as well, go there, 
just click on something called my network and then on your area or on your zone and then you will be able to see everyone in this room and you guys can connect to it. So if you guys could do this, I would connect to you guys and if you had any questions, just come up to me. Thank you so much. <coughs> Yo. Excellent.